Hi, welcome um, to Ask the Expert. We have uh, the very distinct pleasure of having uh, Joe Zhu and Steve Wang coming to us from New York City at Will Cornell Medicine. And today they're gonna be discussing restoring glucose homeostasis with stomach-derived human insulin secreting organoids, which is a really hot topic right now. Just a quick bio, um, Joe Zhu um, received his PhD from Caltech where he studied neurodevelopment and after postdoctoral training uh, as a Damon Runyon fellow actually at Harvard with Dr. Douglas Melton, he started his own laboratory at the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology at Harvard College in 2009. And then in 2019, um, he moved to the Division of Regenerative Medicine at Will Cornell Medicine. His laboratory is a pioneer in the field of cell fate determination and reprogramming, and his work is among the very first to show that cells and adult organs can be reprogrammed to assume new identities and perform new functions. He's currently okay. leading efforts to develop cell fate engineering technologies to produce islet-like organoids in the human stomach tissues to treat type 1 diabetes, and his laboratory is also investigating intestine um, tissue plasticity and developing therapeutics for digestive failure and inflammatory bowel diseases. And um, we also will be speaking with Dr. Um, Steve Wang. He's a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Joe Zhu at the Will Cornell Medical College. He received his BS in biotechnology from Zamen University in China and his PhD in molecular biology from the University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong. His current research goal is to develop a technology to derive large numbers of functional insulin secreting cells from the abundant renewable sources of gastric stem cells to treat type 1 diabetes. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Monica, thank you so much. We, uh, uh, we very much appreciate the invitation to participate in this uh, great forum. You know, we have followed sugar science for years, and it's really a uh, terrific platform to, uh, to for us to be informed about the latest science and development in the type 1 diabetes field. So today, uh, Steve and, and I will discuss a mostly focus on a study that's recently uh, concluded um, that will appear online in Nature Cell Biology next week. Oh, so good. You, I'll yes. be looking for that. Yeah. So if you need more de details and you can dig in there. Now, this study is part of the long long-term pursuit of, of my lab um, to develop a novel cell therapy to treat uh, type 1 diabetes. Um, and the study actually went through quite uh, some challenges, up and downs, took us five years to, to finish. But uh, we are very lucky that we have Steve here, who is a fantastic scientist. Uh, he led a team uh, that overcame a number of challenges were, were able to finish. I think a, quite an interesting prototype of this cell therapy that uh, we're gonna tell you. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna give you a few uh, slides and introduction just to uh, tell you why we pursue this line of research. And then uh, most of the time, I think I'm gonna pass the podium to Steve and he will tell you uh, this technology and the studies and the data that we have. And then we'll address your questions um, at the end together. Sounds great. Okay, so insulin, um, this uh, was discovered in 1921. Um, what is shown in this picture is the first bottle of insulin that was used to treat this very first patient. His name's Leonard Thompson. Um, he was injected in January, 1922 uh, from purified insulin from animals. And he was a dying child. Uh, look at him in the picture. He was very healthy and rescued. So insulin is miracle for sure. Now. The issue, however, <laughs> is 100 years later, uh, we pretty much use the same uh, way to treat uh, type 1 diabetes or other insulin-dependent diabetes patients as 100 years ago. That is, we load up an insulin syringe with, with a protein and uh, inject ourselves right be before the meals, right? And not to say that you also need to prick your fingertips draw a little bit of blood and measure your blood glucose uh, to, to go with this. So there are a lot of challenges in terms of logistics, in terms of doing that consistently, and the dosing is impre imprecise. So we know that for a long, very long time. Now, a major advancement in the technology is the insulin pump. So now you can implant a pump and it's just going to do it for you. This is a great technology. And certainly has transformed the lives of many people. 
Um, nevertheless, the technology is not quite there yet, and people call their artificial pancreas, uh, very uh, apt description. Nonetheless, it's not the pancreas uh, because it's quite burdensome to use, and there are you know, risks of parts failure, among other things, which I won't discuss. There are pros and cons to this continuously evolving technology. And many people choose not to use it to be, and, and some are don't have access to the insulin pump. So the aggregated effect is even today, um, T1D patients have uh, lived about 10 years shorter than, uh, than most others. So now a potentially transformative therapy to treat T1D is the cell therapy. The first precursor to this cell therapy is the eyelid transplantation. There's practice for decades now. You isolate cadaveric eyelids and infuse into the liver. Normally two or three different donors is required to transplant one patient. Uh, with careful dosing of immunosuppression, you can actually maintain normal glycemia for years. So we know that this works. There are challenges uh, of different types, uh, but clearly one of the major challenges, you don't have many donors. Right. So if you have lots of donors, we can make the donor tissue somehow immunoresistant, and that could really provide a potential cure for this disease. Now, with that in mind, uh, you know, people in academia started and also in the company uh, very hard on this technology for years. Now, the state of art is you can take human embryonic stem cells and derive the so-called SC eyelids. And there's abundant materials you can make and you secrete insulin. So this great technology. And recently you have all heard that the Vertex has started clinical trials and looking potentially very promising. Now, technology is great, but again, there are some potential drawbacks. For example, the process is very complex. Anyone who has done that, you will know that it takes six to seven major steps, two months of time to derive these eyelids. And also, uh, in the current form, you need pretty strong immunosuppression to control not only autoimmunity, also alloimmunity. Now, you can make that into a patient-specific therapy by using the iPSC approach, uh, starting with the skin cells or immune cells, reprogram them into the stem cells, and then differentiate them into eyelids. That certainly has worked, but then the process becomes even more complex. So very long, for a very long time, my lab has really taken by the idea that we could find some alternative ways to make autologous, uh, possibly immune resistant uh, eyelids to, to treat T1D. We really are very convinced that this could provide the real cure for this disease. So uh, this process, IPSC is quite complex. Are there other ways to make eyelids that could be simpler? So that's mostly we pursued. Now, over the years, uh, you know, we tried different things, but one milestone came around 2016 when we discovered to our own surprise that the stomach tissues uh, in animal studies, I should mention, uh, back then was the study in mice, that we discovered surprisingly that the stomach tissues, the mucosal layer, um, actually can be induced to form large numbers of insulin producing glucose responsive cells um, uh, by the influence of three uh, key genetic factors. Uh, these are NGN3, PDX1, MFA. These three factors actually play very important roles in the genesis of beta cells during um, embryonic development. And uh, we can use this to actually induce beta cells, beta-like cells in the stomach, in mice. It's quite surprising to us. Um, we can talk about that. There are scientific rationales why stomach is, is actually the tissue uh, possibly the best to do this. Uh, and low on the figure, you, you can see that these stomach-derived insulin-secreting cells are, are, are quite functional and can potently suppress hyperglycemia and rescue diabetic mice. So that got us thinking, right? Um, because stomach has uh, stomach stem cells uh, at the bottom of, of the crypt layers. Uh, you can harvest these stem cells and grow them. And maybe that could turn into a human patient-specific therapy. 
So then we embarked on back then um, in developing this technology. I'm just giving you a quick summary of what we had in mind at that time. We were thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could just go in and do a tiny biopsy of the stomach, right? So with endoscopy. And this is done on millions of people every year in the United States, uh, uh, and it's very safe. Uh, it is very painless. <laughs> I myself actually has done one, done once, and take a tiny pinhead-sized tissue, and then you put it in the culture dish. You can amplify the stomach stem cells, and then you engineer them to express these three factors, and then we can derive these uh, gastric insulin secreting eyelid-like organoids that we name the genes eyelids or genes organoids, and then we can transplant. That will create a therapy. Now, we're going to have to talk about how we can avoid the immuno, uh, autoimmunity, but you know that's a topic to be discussed on, on a different day. But so, um, and then Steve led the effort and made it happen. We made a prototype. So um, I'm going to pass the podium to Steve to tell you uh, what, uh, what he did. Thank you, Joe. Sounds great. Welcome, Steve. Hi. Um, so how do we actually generate human gastric insulin secreting organoids, genes organoid? So firstly, we need to isolate gastric stem cells from uh, the stomach tissue of donors, and then we expand them in, a vit in vitro, and they grow in these flat colonies. And after you expand them to a certain amount of number that you know, really desire to have, you can activate NGN3 to differentiate gastric stem cells into endocrine cells. And the, the colony fall apart during trans, uh, trans differentiation. And on day two, you can activate PDS on math A. Um, the cells further differentiate into genes precursor, and during which they actually form, you know, cluster together spontaneously. And then you can aggregate them um, on day six, and overnight, overnight the cells form genes organoids. They look pretty similar to iris. Uh, so we, we then, um, successfully um, isolate stem cells and culture them in a the dish uh, from the stomach tissues of multiple donors. So corpus is the main body of the stomach. So we actually successfully uh, make many dish, uh, many uh, cell lines. And actually the cells, the stem cells, um, many express uh, SOX9 stem and progenitor markers and KI67 proliferation markers. And the doubling time of, of the gastric stem cells is approximately 48 hours. So if, if you start with the, the stomach sample, you can actually get more than a billion cells within two months. So once you get enough uh, stem cells, you can start to differentiate them into genes organoids. And um, data shows that the genes organoids contain at least four types of endocrine cells. Um, the immunostaining shows that in the genes organoids, um, at least 70, roughly 70% 70 of the cells are C peptide positive. And they also, they also contain the other minor populations, which are glucagon, smetacetin, or ghrelin positive cells. So here is the quantification showing that like roughly 70% of the cells are C peptide and MFA co, um, co expressed uh, co positive cells. So that's actually kind of been the holy grail to try to get some of the stem cells to become, you know, delta cells, which looks like you guys have, uh, you have yeah. gotten that to happen. So that's fantastic. So you're getting some delta, alpha, beta, uh, a nice mix. Yeah, right. It's a mix. And basically all the four types endocrine cells can be found in uh, either cells, right? Either endocrine cells. Right. Uh, but they are quite minor. We only have like 5% to 10% the other cell types. Mm -hmm. The majority of the cell types are C peptide bond, the insulin positive cells. Okay. We also did um, flow cytometry and show very consistent results, 70% of which are uh, C peptide positive. And we also have 4% like, of smetacetin positive and 1% of glucagon positive. And uh, more importantly, we have um, we found that the genes organoids had very similar insulin content if we compare with human primary human islets. Then to evaluate the functionality of the genes organoids we created, uh, we conducted glucose stimulated insulin secreting assay or also named as um, GSIS, GSIS assays. Uh, we found that 10 days post differentiation, 
genes organoids already gain functionality uh, as, as high glucose actually trigger higher insulin secretion. And different batches of the uh, genes or organoids show consistent glucose responses, sickness. And we're also able to derive genes organoids from uh, another donor, and they also show uh, GSIS. Genes organoids were also able to secrete insulin in response to sequential stimulation of um, high glucose challenges. And more impressively, uh, genes organoids were able to strongly respond it, uh, to the GLP-1 analog, the grotototite. Uh, although the enhancement in insulin secretion during high glucose challenges was only three to four fold uh, during this phase, uh, indicating that the uh, genes organoids are not fully mature yet in vitro. Um, to further understand the cell identity uh, in the genes organoids, we perform a uh, single cell RNA sequencing to compare the genes organoids with human islets. And we found that genes organoids indeed contain uh, cell types that resemble human islet endocrine cells, including beta, -like, beta cells, alpha cells, um, delta cells, and epsilon cells. And they do express canonical um, islet endocrine cell markers. For example, glucagon, TTR, and GC in the alpha-like cells of genes organoids, um, smetostatin and H-hex in a uh, delta-like cells and ghrelin in the epsilon cells. More importantly, the, the beta-like cells in genes organoids express uh, insulin, glucagon, uh, glucokinase, ABCC8, PEC6, NK2.2, PCXK1, G6PC2, all of which are important functional uh, beta cell functional genes or identity genes. So to better understand the, the cell conversion from the stem cells into genes beta-like cells, we also perform single cell RNA sequencing to profile the cells in the stem cell culture, which contain the, the gastric stem cells and the mucus secreting cells spontaneously differentiated from the stem cells in the culture. And then we applied uh, the scorecards of gastric and human eyelid beta uh, cells benchmarked in the a, in a public databases. And we found that the beta-like cells from the genes organoid scored similarly to eyelid beta cells in both gastric signature and eyelid beta cell signature. And in comparison, the mucus secreting cells and the gastric stem cells scored higher in the gastric signature and lower in the beta cell signature. So in summary, this data shows that um, the beta-like cells, the genes beta-like cells, uh, actually possess a general molecular properties of the, of the um, human eyelid beta cells uh, at single cell level. To further characterize the genes organoids in vivo, we transplanted uh, genes organoid in, under the kidney capsule of the immunocompromised uh, mice, NSG mice, and we found genes organoids can actually grafted and survive more than six months and a graft uh, contain abundant insulin positive cells perfused with the CD31 positive vasculature and a, a few glucagon, smetostatin, and ghrelin positive cells. And the grafted gene, gene cells also co express um, maturation marker ENTPD3, uh, PEC6, PEP in case 2.2, and a very critical enzyme, PCSK1. Uh, and most of the grafted genes uh, secrete insulin in response to glucose, suggesting uh, genes organoids are actually functional in vivo. And we then transplanted genes organoid uh, derived from two different patients um, into the diabetic mice. And we found rapid, rapid reversion of the uh, rapid reversal of the diabetes. They were able to uh, maintain glycemia, uh, normal glycemia. Uh, until we remove the, the graft by uh, nephrectomy. Consistently, um, the, the, the mice with genes graft uh, showed significantly improved glucose tolerance. And then we pr profile um, uh, using single cell RNA seq again. We try to compare the transcriptomics of uh, before and after transplantation of genes organoids. And we found that after transplantation, uh, the genes organoids has higher level of maturation markers, including ENTPD3, UCN3, PEC6, 
and reduce level of un unwanted genes like ghrelin and TFF2, which is a stomach uh, marker. And interestingly, the insulin uh, expression was actually become much, much more uniform compared with before transplantation. Uh, indeed, we do. Uh, we also did um, very comprehensive correlation coefficient analysis to try to compare one cell to the other and to evaluate the homogeneity of the of the cells. And we found that after transplantation, uh, genes organoids become the gene cells become more uniform before uh, compared with uh, organoids. And more importantly, also very important, the gene cells pose minimal teratoma risk. So in the first picture. This is the gene cells we transplanted, uh, we just transplanted. And after 100 days, uh, we dissect the, the kidney and we found no tumor formed. We've done this for more than 100 times and we didn't see one tumor formed. And indeed, the gene scrub didn't show any um, proliferating cells marked by EDU standing. As a positive control, small intestine contain abundant proliferating cells. We also transplanted gastric stem cells labeled with MTRE without any differentiation. And after 80 days, we didn't see any survived cells. To better understand how the gastric stem cells differentiate into the functional gene cells, we actually uh, sample key stages during gene cells formation. And then we, we profile by single cell RNA-seq and integrate the data uh, with the human islets. I was able to identify uh, one population of stem cells, two populations of endocrine progenitors, one population of genes precursor, and four populations of endocrine cells, including alpha-like, beta-like, um, epsilon-like, and delta-like cells. But the majority of the final population is beta-like cells. Here is the trajectory analysis. Um, it shows how the stem cells gradually become uh, the final bear like cells, uh, which is correlated with the, the expression level of the, of the PDS1 MFA transgenes. So, in summary, we found uh, TFF2 positive and SOX9 double positive um, gastric stem cells uh, can differentiate up to, up to the activate engine 3 into uh, endocrine progenitors, which are SOX4 and HEX6 positive. And with the activation of PDS1 MFA, the cell further uh, differentiated into gel positive and SSTR2 positive genes precursors. And eventually, they become uh, the insulin positive beta like cells. And, and this is um, something we are currently working on. It's not published yet. And we propose to uh, make a synthetic circuit that can further simplify the genes pre production. The current protocol is like you need to do two steps, but now we can further simplify it into one step. The idea is that we need. Uh, a synthetic drug that can activate NGN3, and the active NGN3 can differentiate the cells into endocrine progenitors. And during which stage, um, an artificial endocrine specific promoter can drive the expression of PDS1 MFA, and these two genes would further drive uh, the cell differentiate into uh, beta like cells or gene cells. And here is the preliminary experiment uh, we show that. The, the circuit can actually automatically differentiate the gastric stem cells into gene cells. Um, the efficiency is like somewhere around 15%. And we also uh, found that the, the, uh, the new, the version two genes organoids also show uh, GSIS robustly. So in summary, uh, we are able to develop a, an autologous genes islet to treat D1D. Uh, firstly, we need to have the stomach biopsy sample, and we isolate gastric stem cells. Then we can engineer them um, to, to become a um, uh, like a circuit or something that we can use to differentiate them into genes islets. And we expand them and differentiate them into genes islets, uh, which will be further transplanted into the patients. So the advantage here is that um, the genes organoids will be autologous, and the production will be very simple and the tumorigen risk of the genes organoids is minimal. So finally, I'd like to um, thank all the co-authors in the lab and out of the lab. I'd like to thank our um, mentors and collaborators and friends uh, within and without our Cornell Medicine. A special thanks also go to um, our uh, financial the funding agencies and uh, 
the most important is the donors. Without the donors and families, we cannot do our study. And thank you very much. We'd like to take any questions from here. Thank you, Joe. That's fantastic new work. Really elegant and um, amazing that you were able to accomplish all of that during the tenure of your postdoc. I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge lift. I wondered, um, of course, I have to bring up the million dollar question. What about immune suppression with these, um, with these organoids? So, um, Monica, let me take the question. So, um, that is something we're working on right now. Um, so, I'm not an immunologist. Uh, fortunately, as you can see on the slides, we collaborate with quite a a number of immunologists from yes. Columbia to Florida and beyond. Uh, and we can only put so many names on here. So there are some important collaborators we have to left out and apologies to, to our colleagues uh, whose names are not here. But so uh, in terms of finding of the autoimmunity, um, um, there are uh, quite a number of studies out there suggesting that, for example, uh, overexpressing a small number of immune regulators. For example, PDL1 is very important. Um, uh, how to see that? A repellent, if you you will, of T cell attacks. And we also know that T cell attacks is the main mechanism of killing of beta cells in the patients. So these and other, uh, uh, for example, additions, if you will into the cells could potentially go a long way in terms of funding of the autoimmunity. Um, and um, um, I think this is quite doable um, and we're testing them um, at the moment. That, okay, that's that's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to bring up, you know, Rita Patino at Pitt and uh, Kazuhiko Yamada just put out an editorial um, recently in Frontiers Endocrinology um, you know, titled Xenoplantation for the Therapy of Diabetes, a New Look. And they're talking about, you know, obviously using the core sign model, um, mm -hmm. what, you know, and, and, and the benefits, uh, pros and cons, really. So, I mean, what about, you know, that model taking the gastric cells from a core sign donor? What do you, you know, what are the pros and cons? Is it, would that be something to consider or do you feel like what you've got already you know yeah of course so. I, sorry um sorry. yeah so of course i mean the, the main reason people go to pigs um is because you can potentially you know grow a large flock of pigs and yeah. pick out the pancreas and just do lots of pancreatic id isolation and use the porcine eyelids uh, hopefully protect in some way um, and transplant people um, well, they're that, allergenic, yeah. right? So the the more than allergenic, yeah. the xenogenic, right? Yeah, xenogenic. So, sorry. Uh, the the have the highest. Uh, that's the main. I think there are a couple of obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a supporter. Actually, at one time, um, I wrote a, a short preview, uh, at, at published uh, somewhere. Nature, yes. And I actually, I'm supportive of that line of research, but I think it takes a long time to mature. First of all, you have to deal with the very, very strong xenogenic immune response. And second, yeah. there are some xenogenic viruses hiding in the pig genome. Um, and people have edited out quite a few of them, but certainly not all of them. Mm -hmm. So the post, uh, the post serious diseases, because some of the porcine virus can directly access human. Uh, but, you know, this line of research being pursued, um, you know, we look beyond just uh, um, T T1D, right? When people develop these porcine models, they also thinking of harvesting, um, you know, take kidney and heart and other organs that help a lot of people that need transplants. Uh, right. So that's really a major push there. Um, I just think that it is going to take time. In terms of gastric, using gastric gene cells from porcine, I don't think uh, we need to go there uh, because if you have the pigs ready, you can just directly use their pancreas and harvest eyelids, right? So this is really aimed at the human gastric approach. Can mm -hmm. we create a patient-specific um, cells that's immune resistant? Then we can go back to the same people that where you take the biopsies from. Yeah, no, that would be ideal if you could get them and make sure that they're cloaked and not tumorigenic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's really exciting talk, uh, and uh, also I'm sorry I didn't follow the whole talk. 
because I have to run some of my own work now. And um, I, I do read your paper, which is really exciting. And also I want to know, based on all of the, the protocol, what kind of the dual hormone, uh, like the, the glucagon positive and the insulin positive cell in your, like the whole uh, platform. The second one, uh, when the people talk about the transplant, the uh, beta-like cells from the uh, IPSC or the stem cell, I just want to know, should we also increase the certain amount of the alpha cell in the Alice agonoid to support all of the, the beta cell? If that's the, do, the case we're supposed to do, uh, what kind of percentage of the mature alpha cell in your, like the, the whole platforms? Thank you. Do you want to take the question? So the first question is the dual hormone. Uh, we only, I think we only have, let me double check, I think we only have 1%, maybe lower than 1% uh, of dual hormone, like including the alpha, alpha uh, glucagon, insulin positive cells, semesterine and insulin po double positive cells. Majority of them, 99% of 90 something percent of them, we have the specific number in our paper and the, and the preprint. Uh, majority of them are uh, monohormonal. Uh, and and basically insulin positive cells. We do have very few um, glucagon positive cells, like uh, one percent, five five to eight percent of semesterine, and a little bit of um, granulin positive cells. And people also, um, uh, yeah, some people have claimed that alpha cell are very important for uh, for glycemic control and for to support. Um, they have some inter uh, like uh, they have they have to interact with each other in the in the in the eyelids uh, to make a better functions. Um, we are not quite sure about that yet, but uh, if we want do need more beta cell uh, alpha cells, we now we are also working on that as well. So uh, we can do um, we have some way to enrich the alpha cells, uh, and then we can combine two protocol together so that you have. A more desired number of different percentage of alpha cell and beta cell. We're still working on that, and, and um, hopefully, in a, in a couple of months, we can have a, a better answer for that. How we can make it happen, sophisticated, sophisticated. Yeah. But just add a little quick on, on here. I mean, I, your questions are are great. Um, what about alpha cells, delta cells? I think Monica initially also. Uh, you know, mentioned that. What about the other cell types? What's the right proportion to make them function properly? I think uh, there are many papers published and pulling you in one direction or the other. Some suggest it's very important. Some suggest it's, it's not that important. You know, what is the right answer? Um, I think it depends on how people did these different experiments. Um, and um, uh, some of the most decisive experiment, in my opinion, has not been done, uh, being done at the moment. For example, um, let's see, we can't do that in human, but mouse. Let's see, what if you delete all the alpha cells? What if you delete all the delta cells in the eyelids? And will they malfunction? Uh, maybe it's not in my place to say it because recently, uh, you know, we invited Pedro Herrera from the University of Geneva here to give a talk, and, and uh, he did that. And the results, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, at some point will be in print. I don't want to preempt amp this. I'm not even sure I'm allowed to share that. But there, there's a big question mark. How important are they? Um, uh, can you retain most of the function without these cells? I think the answer could very well be yes. Uh, maybe not 100%, but you're going to get 95%. But, but but that may just be good enough. Yeah. So, and also uh, uh, based on the your remarks, I just want to give another uh, episode on this topic. So the reason I ask the alpha cell is because uh, my hypothesis just if we just develop uh, drop uh, the alpha like or the beta cell together, and the transplant even the xanogram. I just want to say which type of the cell got the more immunogenicity. So in the T1 D patient, the alpha cell don't uh, have that much the immune attack. So what happens for them? 
I just want to know uh, if the stem cell is the good approach and also maybe that's also can tell us some what happens with the alpha cell in the T1D cell, in the T1D condition. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know, again, you know, it's, it's a great question. Just quick, quick discussion on that. Um, yes, alpha cells, delta cells, all the cells in the IDC and T1D is spared and attack very specific to beta cells. I mean, the traditional thought has always been because beta cells express highly specific antigens that are recognized by T cells and other cells, right? Insulin itself is the most prominent, perhaps, autoantigen. There's also GAS65, um, other things. There's a I think quite quite a long list of all the antigen people pointed out. Uh, some are extremely rare, some quite common. Uh, but is that all? Is that all the antigen all the answer? Uh, I think unfortunately we don't, you know, again, conversation with the immunologists is that yes, it's a major recognition mechanism, but that's probably not all there is. There are other things going on, very complex. We don't all understand. Could you make a cell? Could you, I think perhaps what you are thinking is, could you, could we make a cell that actually can do beta cell function, but it's not re really recognized as, as somehow a perfect beta cell. And therefore you may evade, uh, it, it may evade a lot of the uh, autoimmune attacks. Could you do that? Uh, that, that that's something we are thinking very hard, but it's very hard to model that in animal uh, in animals or even humanized mice because the immune interaction is quite complex. But we can try to do that, and but I I don't think you can completely evade it because insulin itself is major of antigen, right? So, uh, but you could dampen that uh, potentially. Uh, that could help a lot. Great question. I guess I would also say. Um... I know at one point Mingling Ma was, is in New York and he was working on, you know, sort of the cloak, the invisibility cloak, right? For he and Arturo Vega, those are all, you know, um, coming out of the um, Melton lab. And um, I wondered if you've had conversations with him regarding this, you know, difficult problem. Yeah, so Mingling Ma is actually based, based in main campus in Ithaca. Mm. So oh, that's about, right. Sorry. We're about for 300 miles and four hours drive by car. Yeah. But I've talked to him and mainly also, um, you know, came from uh, the MIT lab, uh, the, the bioengineering lab. So he, he has great, terrific platform. Yeah. Um, and um, there are different technologies. Uh, I think what you're referring to is whether there are other ways to do this immuno evasion, immuno resistant, other than engineering right. the cells. There certainly are. There are, for example, great technologies in terms of engineering the matrix uh, that's basically you embed the beta cell edits uh, in, um, and these could have something like a fast ligand. You, you know, you uh, the work uh, by um, um, Andrea Gar Garcia and other people. I, I'm sorry, I'm just throwing a few names that, that come to mind, but certainly there are many uh, out there working on this, that basically you don't have to engineer the cell. You engineer the matrix surrounding the cells. Right. They come in, the immune cells come in, you repel them using the matrix. And there are also approaches, as you know, um, and, and uh, perhaps one of the prominent uh, pro proponent of the approach would be Jeff Bluestone, uh, T regulatory cells to induce okay. tolerance, and again, many other people, uh, not just him, uh, but certainly he's a he's a big proponent. I, you know that he's developing now, engaged full time in developing this approach in the company. Well, it, for certain, it's going to take you know a multi approach solution. I think from everything we're seeing, hearing, and reading that um you know it's 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 just not going to be a one and done it's a complex disease and and you guys know that probably more than anyone so um but it's amazing what you've um completed to date um fantastic uh, i understand that you've put together a consortia in new york the, the nyc t1d network so hats off for that as well it's a very rich environment for type 1 diabetes studies and as well you know we know that the jader headquarters are in new york um just a little bit uh you know, whatever it is, very close to Tribeca. And so, you know, I think that it's, um, 
it, it, there's a lot going on in New York City, and we welcome um, you know any other scientists who would be interested in presenting on the platform. And thank you both again very much for uh, this excellent work and for sharing it with us. Thank you, Monica. That's uh, hope to uh, you know connect in the future. And when we develop our newest technology, we'd love to tell you more about that in the future. Fantastic. We'll be looking for the paper and we'll be promoting it as well. So have a great rest of the day. Thank you so Thank much. You too.